So, <clears throat> so I'm, today I'm going to be talking about gastrotrix, which are probably a fairly obscure group of organisms for paleontologists. But mostly what I'm going to be talking about is uh, sort of in reference to body size. And uh, body size is quite a compelling feature when we're thinking about the Cambrian explosion. And sort of a transition from a small to a large body size has been used as one of the arguments for why we, we might not have a good ri uh, record of, um, of neoproterozoic bilaterians. And uh, so this is a classic, uh, classic figure from uh, Bud and Jensen from 2000, where one of the hypotheses they discussed, although we're not too fond of, was that uh, uh, primitively bilaterians were tiny and myofaunal and then transitioned to uh, large body sizes independently of each other uh, near the base of the Cambrian. So we do have some uh, record of myofauna uh, in the form of trace fossils. So these are some myofaunal trace fossils that I worked on from Brazil and described last year. And at the bottom here is a fantastic uh, fossil of a myofaunal lorisiferin, also from the early Cambrian. And so <clears throat> although these tell us that myofaunal animals were definitely around and doing their thing in the early Cambrian, they often uh, post-date the first appearance of macrobenthic animals. And there's the obvious potential for uh, a really telescoped record of, uh, of myofaunal animals just because they're so difficult to preserve. So uh, f for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be talking about um, myo myo uh, myofaunality as it uh, relates to spiralians. So spiralia is the group of organi organisms that, I'm, that I work with most closely. And uh, you're probably familiar with uh, like the lophotrochozoans or the trochozoans, which is the familiar groups of animals like uh, mollusks, annelids, uh, nemertians, and brachiopods, and so forth. But actually, based on uh, recent phylogenomic results, we find that a lot of... Uh, a lot of small-bodied um, and myofaunal taxa occur at the base of spiralian phylogeny. And this invites the possibility that actually uh, spiralians themselves evolve from some sort of myofaunal or small-bodied ancestor. But then when we actually look at the spiralian fossil record, we find that none of these groups are really represented at all. Rotifers have, uh, maybe have a, a record from the Eocene uh, in amber, but most of the spiralian uh, fossil record is dominated by macroscopic groups particularly mollusks, uh, and then when we have soft tissue preservations, things like, things like annelids as well. So today, so this is just a, a look at what some sort of spi uh, microscopic spiralians look like. So they're often transparent, they're tiny, kind of obscure, a bit esoteric. Uh, so the, the examples that I'm showing here are uh, archaeanalids, which we now know are secondarily uh, reduced um, polychaetes. So they've uh, been become... Uh, second, secondarily miniaturized from a macroscopic ancestor. And then we also have things like rotifers or uh, uh, nathostomulids, which are both types of jawworms. But I'm going to be focusing on gastrotrichs. So gastrotrichs are a group of microscopic spiralians. Uh, in the modern, they never exceed three millimeters in length, and they're typically uh, only a few hundred microns. And they, <coughs> they inhabit a, a place called the mesosalmon, which is the space in between sand grains where they move around using ciliary gliding, uh, like this handsome Keita noted that we have here in this, uh, in this video. And uh, some, uh, some phylogenomic studies suggest that they might be the sister group of platyhelminths or the true flatworms. So gastrotrix have a, a sort of very interesting body plan. They're, uh, they're worm-like, although this is very variable. So they can be uh, strap-like and long, or they can be shaped like a bowling pin. And uh, one, of their, one of their key features is the fact that they've got uh, ciliation is just restricted to their ventral surface, which is what they, uh, what they actually use to, uh, to move around. So that's where the name gastrotrich comes from, because of their hairy bellies. And they're also covered in these cuticular specializations, although there are some that don't have these. Uh, so like scales and spines, or like these, these branching things called anchors that we, uh, that we see here as well. And one of their key features is the fact that the, uh, their pharynx is differentiated from their midgut. It has its own cuticle, and it has this distinct Y shape, and it's used for sucking in uh, things like diatoms. So they use this type of suction feeding uh, using this Y shaped pharynx. And sometimes this pharynx can have pore, these exhalant pores that are open to the environment that allow them to expel water and take in their, and take in their food. And they're also covered with these adhesive tubes, which are a, a type of adaptation to living in between sand grains. So when they're locomoting around, they, these little adhesive tubes that you can see, uh, see magnified here are what allows them to stick onto sand grains. So they have, uh, so they have some sort of curious uh, specializations that allow them to live in the myofaunal realm. And these, this is what uh, extant gastrotrich diversity looks like today. So we have macro macrodaciids, which are primarily mar uh, marine, and then also ketonotids, which are primarily freshwater. And the main difference between these is the, the type of cuticular specializations they have, whether their pharynx is a Y shape or an inverted Y, and the presence of these pharyngeal pores. So this is sort of like the, uh, the main cut and thrust of my talk. I'm going to be talking about um, a couple of new fossils that we have from the early Cambrian that we think are related to gastrotrichs. So this is a, a specimen of our first taxon here, and you can see it's a long vermiform animal, uh, about 10 centimeters in length, and it has a clearly differentiated uh, foregut, 
uh, and then an undifferentiated, uh, undifferent, undifferentiated midgut. And if we look a little bit closer, it has this distinct cuticular specialization that occurs in the mouth. And uh, when we first saw this, we thought, huh, like this looks like it's made up of, very, uh, of lots of small teeth, but they're actually all fused together uh, to form this plate that forms over the mouth. And you can see a little bit of the gut here sitting on top of the mouth. So this is a, a feature that's sitting on the roof of the mouth and holding it open, which is, uh, which is something that we see a lot in extant gastrotrichs, and it's something that allows them to suction feed. And this is similar to the, uh, the oral hood that we see in some particular groups of gastrotrichs. So this thing on the, uh, on the right hand side is a thomaster dermatid. Uh, and you can see here that it has these longitudinal, longitudinal ridges in the, uh, in the cuticle in the mouth that holds the mouth open. Very similar to what we see from this early Cambrian fossil from Chengzhang. And this, the body is also covered in these, like, in these tiny sclerites. Some of which I think that you can see in this image here more clearly than, than the others are are branched and forked, much like the anchor sclerites of extant microdacid uh, gastrotrichs. And in this taxon, they occur all along the body. And then we also have a, a second new taxon, which, uh, like, the, like the one I previously showed, has uh, this differentiated foregut. And you can see the, the ridges here that define the Y shape of the, uh, of the gut, where you have the, uh, the cuticularization of the pharynx. And then this, uh, this, lobe, uh, this lumpy, three-dimensionally infilled, uh, infilled hide gut. And if we take a look at this in a little bit more detail, so uh, like I said before, you can see the, uh, the, three, uh, the three cuticular areas that define the Y-shaped lumen of the, of the pharynx. And we can also see that there's, again, a, cuticular, a cuticularization at the front of the head that holds the mouth open, forming a distinct pl uh, plate at the front of the animal. And again, this animal is very large in comparison to extant gastrotrix, so several centimeters in length. And this has a, a couple of other similar features that we see also in extant gastrotrix. So the buccal cavity uh, and, uh, is, like, is connected to the, uh, the lumen of the pharynx by a distinct cuticularization. And you can see here in this uh, extant keto noted where the cuticle is thickened uh, at, the, at the very front of the pharynx, as well as the, uh, the cuticular hood that we see in both species. And this, uh, we have uh, a few different preservation types of this specimen, so in the, of this species. So in the last one, we saw that there was a, a very clear uh, mineralization infill of the gut. Here we have an organic preservation of the gut, and you can see that it has a subterminal anus, also very much like extant gastrotrix. And we also have a very uh, different, type of, uh, different type of sclerotome in this animal. So you can see that in the anterior region, it's covered in these uh, hook-like spines. And then in the posterior region, which is what you can see uh, in this view here, we have these sort of uh, circular elements that have a broad base and then a sort of narrow pointed tip that we see uh, in dorsal view here. And these, are, and these occur most heavily along the, along the front of the animal and then also at the posterior. And again, you can see a, a really nice view of this specimen here where you can see the, the anterior mouth being held open by the cuticular shield, uh, the spiny sclerites covering the body. And again, we can see this bilayered pharynx structure and a cuticular and a, a, a three-dimensional infill here that, de, uh, that defines the, uh, the basal keel of the pharynx, showing that it has a Y-shaped lumen. And we also have some anterior spines that occur, he, uh, that occur here that are possibly accessory feeding structures that we also see in, uh, in extant gastrotrichs. So this is a freshwater species that has something called the mouth basket here. So this is ketonotus. And then this is a marine species here that also has these cuticularizations surrounding the mouth that we can see, uh, we can see projecting here in this specimen. And we, can also, and, yeah, and we also see these, uh, we see these in a number of different gastrotrichs where they have these specialized spines that surround the mouth. So, although, so although we, we find uh, sort of uh, spiny looking vermiform animals that have more or less anterior mouths and cuticularizations in the mouth uh, in a lot of different phyla, uh, so we find uh, scalid rings in things like priapulids with anterior mouths or, or hooks on the introverts of cypuculans where they have perioral tentacles, or, <clears throat> or even uh, the cuticularizations in the mouth of things like nathiferans, the character combination that we find uh, in, our new, in our new specimens are very much restricted only to things that we see in extant gastrotrix. So this is just going through some of like, the, uh, the principal characters that we see in these, in these different phyla. And <clears throat> some of the key features that we see are um, uh, the fact that we have a straight gut, uh, so it's very much unlike a cypunculin. We don't have any evidence of perioral tentacles. We have both terminal and sort of uh, ventral mouths, which are things that we see in gastrotrix. And then this myoepithelial sucking pharynx, although it occurs in other phyla, it has a structure very similar to what we see in extant gastrotrix, where it's bilayered with the mouth held open with a particular type of cuticular sclerotization. 
So this is our, our reconstruction of what we thought, what we think this animal might have been doing in the Cambrian Ocean. So uh, because the gut is three-dimensionally infilled, you might think that it's a sediment infill. But actually in Cheng Zhang, a, a lot of the taxa that we find with three-dimensional infills are things that are inferred to be predatory in the Burja Shale. So it's quite possible that, uh, that our, our new Cambrian gastrotrip was suction feeding uh, and eating and feeding on small invertebrates, much like they do on uh, diatoms today. So this is uh, the first new taxon that I showed with the broad plate that covers the, uh, that covers the mouth. And then this is the other with the, uh, with the more pronounced spines on the anterior and the posterior of the body. And uh, so this is a, a sort of preliminary phylogenetic analysis incorporating, um, incorporating uh, our, new, our new taxa into gastrotrich phylogeny. I'm actually working on an updated version which will have a species level, uh, more or less species level sampling, or genus, at least genus level sampling of extant gastrotrichs for which we have good molecular data. And we can recover these things in the gastrotrich stem group. And this is really useful because it can tell us something about body size evolution, because we, we can now infer that gastrotrix evolved from a macroscopic ancestor in the Cambrian. So this is just showing uh, one of our new species to scale with uh, the size of a typical gastrotrich, which is less than one millimeter, and also the largest known gastrotrix, uh, macrodasis, which is about three millimeters in length. So just to sort of sum up, we have two, uh, two new taxa with distinct anatomical similarities to gastrotrichs, which strongly suggest a gastrotrich affinity. And our phylogenetic analysis recovers them in the gastrotrich stem group, indicating that large, body, uh, that large body size is plesiomorphic for gastrotrichs and that they secondarily invaded the myofauna, probably after the Cambrian. And uh, this is just to, to say thanks to my co-authors, and here are some, uh, here are some, some very large gastrotrichs with some regular-sized humans for scale. So thank you very much.